what the hell are you thinking about? It's weird. And what's happened, of course, is that we're standing a bit for some combination of basic morality and sturdy common sense. And it's amazing how well Berkshire Hathaway and the Daily Journal, for that matter, have succeeded with nothing more than basic morality and sturdy common sense. But of course, when people talk about common sense, they mean uncommon sense. Every time you hear that somebody has a lot of common sense, it means he's got uncommon sense. And it is much harder to have common sense than is generally thought. Let me give you an interesting example. In the investment world, people, it involves an enormous amount of high IQ people trying to be more skillful than normal. You can hardly imagine another activity that gets so much attention. And weird things have happened. And years ago, one of our local investment counseling shops, a very big one, they were looking for a way to get an advantage over other investment counseling shops. And they reasoned as follows. We've got all these brilliant young people from Horton and Harvard and so forth, and they work so hard trying to understand business and market trends and everything else. And if we just ask each one of our most brilliant men for their single best idea, then created a formula with this collection of best ideas, we would outperform averages by a big amount. And that seemed plausible to them because they were ill-educated. That's what happens when you go to Harvard and Wharton. And so they tried it out, and of course it failed utterly. So they tried it again, and it failed utterly, and they tried it a third time, and it also failed. And of course what they were looking for is the equivalent of the alchemists of centuries ago who wanted to turn lead into gold. They thought if you could just buy a lot of lead and weight or magic wand over and turn it into gold, that would be a good way to make money. This counseling shop was looking for the equivalent of turning lead into gold, and of course it didn't work. I could have told them, but they didn't ask me. Now, the, the interesting thing about this situation is that this is a very intelligent group of people that's come from all over the world. You've even got a lot of bright people from China where people tend to average out a little smarter. And the issue is very simple, it's a simple question. Why did that plausible idea fail? Just think about it for a minute. You've all been to fancy educational institutions. I bet you there's hardly one in the audience who knows why that thing failed. That's a pretty ridiculous demonstration I'm making. How can you not know that? It's one of the main activity of America. It's an obvious and important failure. Surely we can explain it. You have to have stayed awake in your freshman college courses to answer that question. But if you ask that question at a department of finance, at a leading place, the professors wouldn't answer it right. Now I'm gonna leave you that question because I want you perplexed. <laughs> But that's one you should be able to answer. It shows how hard it is to be rational on something very simple. How hard it is, how many kind of crazy ideas people have and they don't work. You don't even know why they don't work, even though it's perfectly obvious if you've been properly educated. And by the way, my definition of being properly educated is being right when the professor is wrong. Anybody can spit back what the professor tells you. The trick is to know when he's right and when he's wrong. That's the properly educated person. And of course, they're frequently wrong, particularly in the soft sciences. In fact, if you look at a modern elite institution, it's fair to say that a lot of the faculty are a little crazy. It's so left-wing now in the humanities, and it's very peculiar. And that's another thing. Why should 90% of the college professors in the humanities be very left-wing? I leave that question for you too. <laughs> but it happens. Now at a place like Berkshire Hathaway or even the Daily Journal, we've done better than average. And now there's a question, why has that happened? And the answer is pretty simple. We tried to do less. We never had the illusion we could just hire a bunch of bright young people and they would know more than anybody about canned soup and aerospace and utilities and so on and so on and so on. We never had that dream. We never thought we could get really useful information on all subjects, like Jen Kramer pretends to have. <laughs> and we always realized that if we worked very hard, we could find a few things where we were right. 
and that a few things were enough and that that was a reasonable expectation. That is a very different way to approach the process. And if you had asked Warren Buffett the same thing that this investment counseling did, give me your best idea this year, and you just followed Warren's best idea, you would find it worked beautifully. But he would, trying to know the whole, he would give you one or two stocks. He had more limited ambitions. I had a grandfather who was very useful to me my mother's grandfather, and he was a pioneer, and he came out to Iowa with no money but youth and health, and took it away from the Indians. He fought in the Black Hawk, he was a captain in the Black Hawk Wars, and he stayed there, and he bought cheap land, and he, he was aggressive and intelligent and so forth, and eventually he was the richest man in the town and on the bank, and highly regarded in a huge family and a very happy life. He had the attitude, having come out to Iowa when the land was not much more than a dollar an acre, and having stayed there until that black topsoil created a modern, rich civilization and some of the best land in the world. His attitude was that in a favored life like his, when you were located in the right place, you just got a few opportunities if you lived to be about 90. And the, the trick in coming out well was seizing a few opportunities that were your fair share that came along when they did. And he told that story over and over again to the grandchildren who hung around him all summer. And my mother, who had no interest in money, remembered the story and told it to me. But I'm not my mother's natural imitator. And I knew Grandpa Ingham was right. And so I always knew from the very first, when I was a little boy, that the opportunities that were important that were gonna come to me were few and that the trick was to prepare myself for seizing the few that came. This is not the attitude they have at a big investment counseling thing. They think if they study a million things, they can know a million things. And of course, the result is almost nobody can outperform an index. Whereas I sit here with my Daily Journal stock, my Berkshire Hathaway stock, my holdings at Lilu's Asian fund, my Costco stock, and of course, I'm outperforming everybody. I'm 95 years old, and I practically never have a transaction. And the answer is I'm right and they're wrong. And that's why it's worked for me and not for them. And you know, the question is, do you want to be more like me or more like them? <laughs> the idea of diversification makes sense to a point. If you don't know what you're doing and you want the standard result and not be embarrassed, well, of course, you can widely diversify. Nobody's entitled to a lot of money for recognizing that because it's a truism. It's like knowing that two and two equals four. But the investment professionals think they're helping you by arranging a diversification. An idiot could diversify a portfolio or a computer for that matter. But the whole trick of the game is to have a few times when you know that something is better than average and invest only where you have that extra knowledge. And then if you get just a few opportunities, that's enough. And what the hell does you care? You own three securities and JP Morgan Chase owns a hundred. What's wrong with owning a few securities? Warren always says if you lived in a growing town and you owned stock in three of the best enterprises in the town, isn't that diversified enough? The answer is, of course it is. They're all wonderful places. And that fortunes formula, which got so famous, which was a formula to tell people how much to bet on each transaction if you had a, an edge. And of course, the bigger your edge, the more close the transaction was to a certain winner, the more you should bet. And of course, there's mathematics behind it. But of course it's true. It's perfectly possible to buy only one thing because the opportunity is so great and it's such a cinch or only two or three. So the whole idea of diversification when you're looking for excellence is totally ridiculous. It doesn't work. It gives you an impossible task. What fun is it to do an impossible task over and over again? I find it agony. Who would want to do it? And I don't see why. My father had a client. He was a lawyer in Omaha. He had a client whose husband had a little soap company. and. The guy died and my father sold the soap company. This woman was one of the richest people in town in the middle of the Depression. And what she had was a little soap company in a biggest mansion in Omaha's best neighborhood. 
And they sold the sofa company. She had a mansion in the best neighborhood and $300,000. But $300,000 in 1930 something was an incredible amount of money. A little hamburger was a nickel, a big hamburger was a dime, and the all you can eat cafe in the mall would feed you all you needed to stay alive for two bits a day. I mean, 300,000. Well, she didn't hire an investment counselor, she didn't do anything. She's a wonderful old woman. And she just took that and she divided it into five chunks. And she bought five stocks. I remember three of them because I probated her estate. And it was, one of them was General Electric, one was Dow, one was DuPont, and I forget the other two. And then she never changed those stocks. She never paid any advisor, she never did anything. And she bought some municipal bonds, she never spent her income. And she bought some municipal bonds from time to time with the, and by the time she died in the 50s, she had a million and a half dollars. No costs, no expenses. And I said, how did you decide to do that? And she said, well, she said, I thought electricity and chemistry were the coming things. You just chunked it all in and sat on her ass. <laughs> I always liked that little woman. <laughs> My kind of a girl. But it's, it's rare. If you stop to think about it, think of all the expense and palaver that she didn't have to listen to and all the trouble she avoided and zero costs. And of course, what people don't realize because they're so mathematically illiterate is if you make 5% and pay two of it to your advisors, you're not losing 40% a year future, you're losing 90%. Because over a long period of time, that little difference causes a 90% disadvantage to you. So it's hugely important for somebody who's a long-term holder not to be paying a big annual toll out of the performance. And of course, there are a few big time advisors now who are using indexation very heavily. And of course, they're prospering mightily. And of course, every time they get somebody, it's just agony for the rest of the investment counseling business. And this is a very serious problem. And I think these people who are used to winning as old time value investors who are now just quitting the profession, that's a very understandable thing to do. I regard it as more noble than staying in, playing along with the denial. It's an interesting problem. Now you can see I'm not trying to make your morning. I'm just trying to describe things the way they are.